Father, bless these words that we share today, Lord. Uh, teach us what you would have us learn today in our hearts uh, to receive it. And uh, again, bless Peggy out there with the Sunday school kids. Another really great time. In uh, Jesus' name, amen. amen. Matthew 21, verse 23. Um, when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And uh, we were speaking Wednesday, Pastor Mark did an amazing message um, Wednesday night about the uh, story of the man waiting for the water to be stirred. And, um, but I did a little devotional and said we were going to speak on this subject today on authority. And um, we started with the woman taken in adultery. And uh, everybody knows that story. She was uh, caught in the very act. It's amazing the man wasn't caught, just the woman. I don't know how that happened, but it usually takes two for adultery, right? So. Um, anyways, um, we brought out that the, fa the Pharisees really didn't care that the woman was caught in adultery. She was just a pawn. Because they weren't even, um, I mean, they, they challenged Jesus with what the law of Moses said about adultery, but they weren't executing that law any longer. Because so many people were committing adultery, they'd be stoning somebody all the time. But they brought this woman and caught her in the very act just so that they could challenge Jesus' authority. And they thought they had him between a rock and a hot place. They thought, well, if he says that the stoner, he's no longer a friend of sinners and showing compassion, but if, they, if he says not to, then he's violating the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. So we got him. And we know what Jesus said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And nobody could do it, because nobody's without sin. So. But the real point of that story was to challenge Jesus' authority. And you remember, uh, maybe it's still around today, but I think it started in the 90s. There was a t-shirt going around saying, question authority, you know? And like this big new movement, question authority. People questioning authority has been going on since day one, right? If you really study the fall, what was Satan doing but questioning God's authority? hath God really said? And then when she said, yes, God really did say that. Well, he only said that because he knows that if you eat of that tree, you will become like him. Questioning his authority and his motives in that authority. And really, I was thinking about it, it was like, this, most people hate authority, <coughs> don't we? I mean, Sometimes, are there any teenagers here in this room? I mean, it's, it's, are there liars in this room? <laughs> teenagers come to a place in their life where they hate their parents' authority. They might listen to it when they're, you know, four to ten, but then all of a sudden, the teenage years hit, and they hate their parents' authority. Uh, when we get pulled over by the police and they give us a ticket, we hate the authority they have to give us a ticket. You know, wives hate their husband's authority, even in the church. When the church says, listen to your husband, submit to them. We hate that word submit because in it, it requires authority. It requires coming under authority. And we all, in a, in a, because of the fall, because of our sin natures, there's a, something in our lives, we hate our bosses sometimes because of the authority that they have over us. Um, so we have a problem with authority because for the most part, authority is misused. It's misused and abused. And um, many times in the pulpits of churches, pastors will abuse their authority because they have approbation lust. They love power. Yeah. They love the power that has been given to them. Yeah. And so they usurp that power by um, preaching legalism to keep people in control, fear of God that is not healthy to keep people under their control and their thumb, 
Uh, and what they're, they're not doing is uh, th these people, I mean, there are pulpits that preach proper authority, and that's what I want to talk to you about today, of how we can get to a place in our lives where we can come under authority and like it, and like it. Because most people will come under authority because they're forced to, but they don't like it. And nobody, hardly anybody you'll find will say, I feel so safe under your authority. Uh, it takes a real spirituality to be able to say that. And, and an understanding of what true authority is. If uh, parents exercise proper authority, their children would love that authority. Okay? Pa and I'm not coming against parents either today. I'm a parent. And there's been many times where I've exercised proper authority and sometimes few when I haven't exercised proper authority because of anger, because of the emotion of anger. So, in the church, in the body of Christ, we have a tendency as believers to bring our attitude about authority into the authority of the church. And many people struggle with the authority that God has set up in the church because they think it's like the authority that they've experienced in the world. And it's two different things. And so they bring this question to Jesus, in <clears throat> Matthew 21, they say, uh, by what authority do you do these things? And then who gave you this authority? Because according to what they believed, they were the authority of the law of God. And they knew that they didn't give him the authority to do these things and to say these things, so they wanted to know who gave him this authority. But authority was given. Okay? Authority isn't something that, well, he's earned my authority, or his authority I respect because he's earned it. No, authority is given by God. Even in, with rulers, authority is given by God. And to really understand and be able to come under authority or to be able to be a person who can give authority, you have to be able to come under authority. And coming under authority requires some words that we kind of don't like sometimes to, to apply to ourselves. It requires humility, submission, all right, deference, like Okay, I think this way, but you're saying this way, and you have the authority, so I'll come under your authority. And that requires trust. And even when we think we know better, we still have to give way to the authority that is at hand. But if we understand and we see the trait, the true trait of authority, we should not have a problem with that at all. Um, and recognize that authority has been given for my benefit, not for my harm. So, in uh, Titus 2.15 it says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. These, what things? These things speak. Well, what things are you going to have to read Titus 2 to understand what things, but I'll paraphrase Titus 2 for you. Titus 2 was an instruction in how to live, how to conduct yourself in life, how to be an example to children, to uh, masters, to all in your lives. And so at the end of Titus 2, Paul says that um, speak these things with all authority. Like know that you have the power to deliver this kind of message and uh, that power comes from God. Well, so what is the authority, going back to what they said to Jesus, what is the authority, the ability to speak a message on how to live? And who gave you that authority? God did. Jesus Christ did. And so in everything, whether you are a person who is in a position of authority, and you might not think you are, but you are. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, or somebody who is under authority. And what I mean by that is, remember um, the story of the Roman centurion, right? And he comes to Jesus about his servant. And Jesus said, I will come. And he said, no, 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 you don't have to come. You don't have to come. I understand authority. 
I am a man under authority and in authority. And so I say to this person, do this, and he does it. And I say to that person, go there, and he does it. <clears throat> and whatever I say to somebody, he does because I am a man in authority, but it's also because I'm under authority. So he was at, uh, in a chain of command, and they did it. And Jesus marveled at his face because he said to Jesus, you don't have to come, just say the word, and because of your authority, it'll be done. Yeah, it will be done. That's amazing faith to believe in that kind of authority. So we have, we can be in both parts, both positions. We can be um, in authority and under authority. Okay? Um, as the pastor of the church or as a pastor, uh, we have a position of authority to bring the word of God, to deliver the counsel of God, whether it's uh, speaking about love and grace and mercy or speaking about sin, adultery, fornication and all of that. Both things, uh, some things are easier to speak about than others, but we have the authority to speak on all of it, rightly dividing the word of truth and bringing the whole counsel of God to the church. That is the um, authority we have by God. That is the job of the pastor, uh, to put it in simple terms, is, I, don't, I forget who said it, but to... Uh, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable is the job of a pastor, right? And sometimes you have to do both at the same service. So who knows? Somebody might get afflicted today, someone might be comforted by this. But really, all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, at some point we have a problem with authority. And it's because of, and usually you can trace it back to somebody abused their authority in your life. And that's why you don't like it. The, our uh, Adamic nature, that the sin nature, the natural man, does not like spiritual authority at all. It, has, it can't even understand it or perceive it, so it fights against it all the time. So there's no use trying to comprehend spirituality with the natural mind because you won't understand it anyway and your natural <coughs> makeup will fight against it. Because... The spiritual um, teaching of the Word of God tells you in your natural man that you're basically no good. And nobody wants to be told that. And nobody wants to hear that I have no righteousness in me that's of value to God. And nobody wants to tell me that my whole head is sick and my heart is faint. And if you listen to that in the natural, you get offended. And you don't like the authority of that Word. But that Word has an authority with it. By what authority do you say these things? Do you do these things? By the authority of the Word of God. Right? Which is, in Hebrews 4.12, able to penetrate right into your soul. I can break down the Word of God. Can, it's not me that's doing it. It's the Word of God. But I'm speaking the Word of God. So I can pierce to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And the Word of God can penetrate right through to the very issue that's in your heart. And that issue will come down to one thing. Will you accept that authority that's penetrating your heart? Will you be able to agree with it through humility and say, yes, you're right, in light of God's glory and His holiness, there is nothing in me that's good. I can't do anything to, to please God. Only by faith, because this is what the Word, the authority of the Word is teaching right now. So what is the true definition of authority? We, look, we see it in the continuation of the story of the woman caught in adultery. Uh, the Jesus went to the woman and said, Woman, where are those nine accusers? Is there nobody here to condemn you? And she said, No, man, nobody. They all had to leave because they all had sin. Right? He said, Well, then neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And like we said Wednesday, many people are going to say, well, he lets, lets her get away with anything. You can get away with anything with God. No, he, she wasn't getting away with anything. He said, go and do not commit this sin anymore. It was a command. And he was deferring judgment upon her until her life was over. So she wasn't getting away with anything. But proper authority will always, always show mercy first and then correction, and, and in, in the midst of all that is a, a background of love 
All right, of wanting to see a person who has done wrong or is doing wrong restored to doing what is right. That's what true authority produces. That's what a message should produce in a person's life. Not condemnation, but a way out of the trouble they're in. So a pastor can preach on a fornication that's wrong and you shouldn't be doing it, but it's not designed to, to make you feel bad about it. It's designed to show you that why is it wrong? Why is it, why, why should we, we should not just preach and say fornication is wrong, period. But pastor, why is it wrong? Why did God say that? Why is adultery wrong? Why is it a sin to, to judge my brother when they've wronged me? Why do I have to do those things? And when a pastor or a pulpit begins to show why that true authority comes through, that's what true authority does. It releases the person with an encouragement that you can go and not do this anymore. And I have the authority to say that to you. Jesus Christ had that authority more than anybody to say to somebody, go and sin no more. He healed the person's hand on the Sabbath, and they, they chastised him. He goes, what's easy to do, heal a hand or say your sins are forgiven you? I have the authority to do both. Amen. The, to do both. So that authority with Jesus, though, what we see in Jesus' authority is never condemnation. Show me where he condemned somebody. And it, for their sin. <clears throat> and it wasn't that he was letting them get away with it. He was teaching them that there's a better way to go. Yes, your sin can be forgiven, but you don't have to sin anymore. This same chapter in Titus 2 talks about grace. It says, the grace of God has appeared unto all men. And then the next verse says, teaching us to deny ungodliness. So grace didn't appear to, unto all men so we can get away with sin. Grace appeared unto all men with an authority that can teach us to overcome our sin, to, to, to say no to the sin nature. And how do I do that? With the authority of the cross. See, every aspect of God has an authority attached to it. And this is the what authority do you do these things? By what authority do you do these things? By what authority do you overcome sin? By the authority of grace. Grace is, yes, unmerited favor, but it has an authority if I will submit to it. Do you submit to the authority of grace this morning? Do I submit to the authority of grace this morning? I can come in to a church, hear a message on grace, and it sounds wonderful, and it sounds like oh, this, this magical thing, but there's an authority that requires me to submit to it. I come under the authority of grace. And when I come under the authority of grace, I no longer have a mindset that I'm getting away with something. I have a power that lets me overcome it. The, uh, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Why? Because it has an authority yeah. to abound over sin. Not, not to make me get away with sin, but to abound over sin. An authority that is greater than the authority of sin. Which, by the way, sin has an authority. And if I give place to that sin, then that authority will dominate in my thinking and my behavior. And the same is true about grace. If I give place to grace, then that authority of grace will dominate in my thinking. And so, look at the love of God. The love of God has an authority to it, doesn't it? I mean, love helps me to cast out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. How? Because it has an authority over fear. So if I come under the authority of love, if I submit to it, I humble myself under the power of God's love in my life. I don't have to understand every aspect of it doctrinally. I just have to submit to it. And as I submit to it, I come under its authority. And then love is, uh, is able to perform a work in my heart like you've never known. And I begin to understand what it means that the love of God should have brought in my heart. I begin to understand that love can conquer evil. I understand that in a way that I can never understand unless I come under the authority of love. I can hear about love all day long, but it'll, it'll say, oh, that was a nice message, and I go my way, and I do exactly what I was doing before I heard it. But when I come under the authority of love and I submit to it, now love goes with me when I go. And love speaks to my soul, and love instructs me in the way. Uh, <clears throat> How many people have heard the verse, um, to love your enemies, right? How many people can do that? No one can do that. 
in the natural unless you come under the authority of love. And that's what the authority of love enables me to do, to love my enemies. I don't feel like loving my enemies. I don't see why I should love my enemies. They're my enemies. I, I, I can think of all kinds of things to pray for my enemies, but love isn't one of them. <laughs> How can I pray for somebody who is despitefully using me? How can I love somebody who has verbally, or not maybe not verbally, but attacked me behind my back, talking to other people about me, doing that about me, and I know they are my enemy because of what I've been told <coughs> about what they think about me. And here I come across this verse in Matthew chapter 5, says, Love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. And how can I do that? I can hear that in a message, not comprehend it, and walk away saying, well, that's an interesting concept, but uh, I don't know how to do that. Or I can come under the authority of that verse, that word, that has authority, that has power. And, that the mo and how do I come under it? Through humility, understanding that the motive of the, somebody that's in authority, of any, <coughs> anything that's in authority, is to release me in that area and instruct me in that righteousness of a way to go. Not to condemn me, because I'm not doing it. Not to make me feel bad, because I haven't done it. But to make, give me the ability to do it, rather than doing what I've been doing. Harboring bitterness and resentment and hatred in my soul. And so I come under the authority, I agree with it, I say, okay, God, but I can't do it. You have to do it. And he says, exactly. That's what Sophia is always saying to me. Exactly. <laughs> you make a point. And God says, exactly. Yes, you have to come under the authority of my love, of my forgiveness. And grace has an authority. And love has an authority. And forgiveness has an authority. And the word of God has an authority. And how about this? The body of Christ. Do you not understand the body of Christ? Which you are a member in particular has an authority. This church has an authority about it. Right? It has a testimony, but it has a power because it's the power of God. What is the authority? Oh, we love unconditionally. People come in, they say, we sense such love here and such joy here. Why? Because we submit to the authority of God's love for us and thereby give it to others. And that's the testimony of this body. But I tell you this morning that not this church necessarily, but it can happen. But it happens in many churches, just as Satan went to Eve and tried to attack the authority of God with her, he will come to people and try to get them to attack the authority of the church. And it starts with the pulpit, because that's where it starts. The authority of the pulpit. People go and say, who does that pastor think he is telling me about my sin? <laughs> telling me I have to give my money, doing this and that. And they misunderstand the authority of the pulpit. And they, they try and uh, really, they get offended by it. And all kinds of things begin to manifest themselves because a spirit has come in to challenge the authority of the pulpit. Which is not the man, by the way. I, I'm saying pulpit on purpose, purpose because it's the pulpit. Okay? And God has set up an order in the church. And there's an, an order and an authority in the, in the different offices in the church and the way God has set it up. And many people have a problem with it because they think they're coming into a situation that they uh, encountered in the world or in their family or on the job place and it's the same type of authority and it is not. And if it is, you should leave that church. You should not go and listen to that. It's an improper authority. It's an abuse of God's power. And God will deal with that person, believe me. But true authority that comes through the pulpit has first humility attached to it and a recognition that God wants to release you. God wants to set you free. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to experience all of his characteristics and his effects in your life and go out with it. And he wants you, yes, he wants you to stop sinning, but he doesn't expect you to be able to stop it on your own. He wants to give you the power or the authority over your sin. Amen. The disciples could not go out and cast out demons like they did when he sent them out two by two and preach the gospel and do miraculous works unless they were given authority by God. And it says in Matthew, says that he said, I am sending you out with authority or to cast out demons, to raise people, to deliver people. You have that authority in you. You have that authority in you. You do. I do. 
when we received Christ as our Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit came into us, we were given authority over things. We have authority over things. It's so interesting. Um, we're on the streets and we're trying to talk to people about Christ. And this, you can see the battle of authority every time you go soul winning. And, and we're sitting there and people are looking at us like we're these nut jobs trying to hand out these tracks. Yeah. And then <coughs> the devil's right there saying, yes, that's right, you are a nut job trying to hand out tracks. People don't want to hear this. They got stuff to do, blah, blah, blah. But then when we come under the authority of the call to go into all the world and preach the gospel and share it like Tony was saying yesterday, we're just, we're here to give the good news to people. And it's so interesting, a few weeks ago we had so many salvations, it was like everybody would take a track and they'd be reading and talking to us, and so receptive. And yesterday it was like, there, were, ooh, there was a wall up. You know, people didn't even want to take the tracks. You know, I'm good. You know? So God sent us a drunk. You know? And we spent like 30 minutes talking to this guy who was drunk at 10 o'clock in the morning. You know? <clears throat> and then he sent us a Jewish woman. And the first thing she said to us when we were trying to get a track, she goes, I'm Jew. I'm a Jew. Hey. Well, awesome! Yeah. That's awesome, really? Hey. And then it took us almost 30 minutes, but we got him to say the prayer. Amen. Right? Amen. That's right. So, you know, the warfare is there, but there's an authority. We have an authority. When you go so and you think, oh, I hope I can say that. You know, it's not about that. It's about the authority that you have as a child of God. You literally have the dunamis or the power of God inside of you to proclaim his word to people. And you don't even have to worry about what you're going to say. We had no idea what we were going to say to who we were going to say it. It's spontaneous, and it's amazing that the wisdom that comes out of your mouth that God gives you because he's given you authority in that situation. And we're not there to bring out and tell people, you are wicked, you're sinners, you're going to hell, blah, 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 blah. We're there to present the gospel and let people decide for themselves Amen. whether they want or not. Yep. But when the first initial resistance comes up, we're not giving into it and say, oh, who are we to even be here? You're right, we'll go home. You know, people say, "Leave us alone. We don't want that." Oh, uh, and hear the comments and all that. But then there's people who take it, and there's an authority in us. There's an authority in us as Christian parents with our children, the authority to to present the love of God to them, and in correction and in love, teach them the way to go. Amen. And that authority, although it might be resisted at first, will be received, and people can come under that authority. And we get to a place, do we not, where we love to come under the authority of God because we, it, this is where we should be. This is where hopefully we're coming to places in our life where we trust God and what His Word says. And because He's never been unfaithful to me and He's never condemned me and He's never uh, pointed out my sin other than to correct me in love but not to condemn me and make me feel bad about it, then I feel like I'm safe when God's authority comes into play and I can come under it and submit to it. Wow. And it, this signs, when you go into a church and, and you, you can tell if a body is coming under the authority of God or not. Okay? And it's not to point out individual people or anything like that or to cause judgment to happen, but there are this, this signs of any church that's not healthy in that area. Uh, people will uh, not receive the message. You know, we go back to Jeremiah chapter 1 where God said, be not afraid of their faces. You know, sometimes you should have a mirror up here seeing your faces, right? It's like you can tell when people are receiving it when they're not, you know, and not to pass judgment at all, but you can tell if someone's listening or if they're not, if they're bored, if they're, if they're distracted or whatever. <coughs> And again, it's not for judgment, you just, you just can tell, look as a book, right? So, a person that won't come under the authority of the pulpit will be distracted very easily. They will be angry. They will have an angry countenance on. They're not receiving it. 
They'll do all kinds of things. They're pretending they're looking out the window and they're up yeah. here and that, and that, and that. their heads down and they're pretending they're reading something when we're not reading anything. You know, when, when the pastor is speaking, the people should be listening, not reading something else. Right? What is this a form of? It's a form of not being able to come under the authority of the public. You don't like what's being said at the time. You're not interested. And, and so you don't come under it. But a, a body that will come under it, they're, they're involved in the message, they respond to it, and they, they, they listen to it, and then you have to decide, will I accept this teaching from God or not? Uh, another example of uh, a church that won't come under the authority of God is they begin forming little groups here and little groups there, and they begin talking about the messages, and, and not, not to criticize, just to go over some, some, some issues about we have with it. You know, and why don't you go and tell the pastor about it? Oh, no, no, we'll just talk about it. I want to see if so-and-so thinks the same way I do. Of course you do. Of course you do. That's the devil trying to form a satanic alignment. Oh, what are you saying, Pastor? We can't talk about the message? Of course you can. Let's have a wrap and talk about the message all day long. You know, the message of God. That you're misunderstanding the message. If you ever feel like there's a message that, I, I well, uh, my flesh hated it, and that's fine. But your spirit's never going to hate this, the message of the Spirit of God. Because you have the same Spirit. And so your Holy Spirit in you is never going to say, I hate the Holy Spirit that's coming out of the Pastor Jim today. That's not going to happen. So if it is happening, you say, well, what's wrong here? Is it really my spirit that's doing it? Or is it my flesh that's hating it? <clears throat> and so there's all kinds of things that happen. But really what's behind it all, people stop giving. They stop praying. They stop reading the word as much. They stop getting involved in the church with their time as much. And they say, well, I'm busy. Well, I don't have it. Well, this and that. Well, that's not what it is. The problem is, is that you don't like the authority of coming to that church and hearing that message. And when I come under the authority of a, the pulpit of the church I'm going in, guess what we experience? Psalm 133, verse 1, true unity. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. Guess what? You can't have unity unless you have authority. It just doesn't work. Everyone can, oh, no, no, we can just be, weren't they like that in Acts? They were all the same and all of one accord, but they had authority. Read Acts very carefully. There was an authority in the church that the people came under. And that's what produced the one heart. Because they submitted to the authority of God, which was teaching them properly what authority does. Amen. No condemnation, no guilt, but go and sin no more. All right? By what authority do I do these things? By the authority that I'm coming under at the time, the authority of the pulpit, the authority of grace, the authority of the cross. The cross has amazing authority about it, doesn't it? Because I go to the cross and my flesh has to die. But there's resurrection life afterwards. And so, if, if, listen, if you live in the authority of the cross, right, when people do stuff to you, it won't even bother you. It won't, because your, live, your old man has been crucified, so what's there to get offended? How do you offend a dead man? Think about it. Amen. If I'm crucified with Christ, how can that get offended? If I'm walking in the new creation, a new creation doesn't get offended, because it's the new creation. And I recognize in the new creation that any attack against me is an attack from the devil against my new creation, which is Christ. It's not me anyway, so how can I get offended at that? So now I, I come under the authority of the cross. And in that authority, I experience freedom. Yes, death to the old man, and I'm crucified with Christ, and I recognize my old man must die, but I have life in the new man, and in the new man, I don't get offended. People will try and offend me, and we're not perfect. We're going to have things that bother us. Don't condemn yourself, but recognize what's going on. The devil doesn't want me to come under the authority of the cross. Because he knows if I do, I'm going to experience resurrection life on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so, he'll challenge that authority. You know, you don't have, you're not really going to die. Like he said to Adam and Eve, God knows you're not really going to die. And the day you eat of it, you shall surely die, was God's word. What did the devil do? He challenged him. He says, you don't really, you're not really going to die. What does he do with us at the cross? You don't really have to die. You can go to church and still do what you do during the week. You know, it's, it's like I do good here and I do bad there and it all washes out. That's the, the whole program that he's taught. And that's his authority. 
And we can come under that authority and live your life like that, but it's not true authority. It's an authority that brings guilt, shame, and condemnation. And that's what the Pharisees would have said to the woman. They didn't even care about the woman. They were going to stone somebody that they didn't even care that she was doing what she was doing. That was their heart. They just wanted to prove a point with Jesus. And they would have said to the woman, you can't go. You've sinned. You must die. That's what they were saying. That's what improper authority does. It points out sin and makes you feel bad about it. And won't release you from it. But Jesus says, go, I release you, and then sin no more. That's proper authority. And so we teach in the pulpit in the church proper authority. You know, we're going to, yes, we'll speak about sin. Yes, we'll speak about right thinking. Yes, we'll think, speak about the way we should go in our lives, the way we should conduct ourselves, the way we should be examples. But it's done because of the love of God and through the love of God, which won't make me feel bad if I'm not doing it, but it will challenge me that I can do it in, Je in Christ Jesus. And that's proper authority. So now we, we, it's up to us again, as most messages come down to, this choice, uh, will I submit to the authority of God or not? The question's been answered, by what authority do you do these things? But what, By whatever authority God has called me to be under at the time. And that's the most amazing thing in closing, you think about it, that we have all these different attributes of God, and they all have an authority attached to them to, to help me in the situations that I encounter in my life. There's days when I need grace to be dominant in my life. There's days when I need to be at the cross in my life. There's days when I need for the authority of forgiveness in my life because I'm called to forgive somebody that I don't want to forgive. But if I come under the authority of forgiveness that teaches me that I've been forgiven, so therefore I'll forgive. And I'm not going to wait for a feeling to do it. I'll just do it because God forgave me, and so I'll forgive you. Who am I to hold a grudge when God didn't hold a grudge against me? If you put it in that light, you're coming under the authority of forgiveness. And, and it's not a feeling that you're waiting for. It's just an obedience to the authority of God. And then you watch what happens in your soul, how all the hurt and the scar tissue will go away and be healed. The forgiveness will come after that. The, 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 the uh, freedom from having that bother you to no end. And this is what God really wants, after all, in your life. He's, is, is for you to be set free from those things in your life by coming under His authority and His plan for your life. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, if you just bow your heads and close your eyes, uh, as we do every service, if you're here today, you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to do so. so. Come under the authority of the cross right now. The cross is where Jesus Christ died for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the world. And all we have to do and all we're, we're called to do is to receive that and believe on it. And that takes humility because I have to acknowledge that I'm a sinner, but I can't do anything about my sin. But Jesus Christ did. He died for your sin on the cross. And you receive him. A simple little prayer in your heart, just calling upon God as your Savior. He will do the rest. He will come in. He will teach you the way. He will show you what you said is true. God will perfect the work in you. But I'm asking you this morning, if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, here in this room or watching on video, say this prayer right now in your heart if you'd like to. Dear Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and live. And uh, if you said that this morning here, could you put up your hand? We want to give you a Bible and some information. Anybody saying that? Just stick your hand up, put it back down. Father, anyone watching on video, write us a, a note or a line and we'll send you a Bible. Father, thank you. I think I like authority right now. I think I, think I do. Thank you for the authority that loves us, that teaches us, instructs us. Lord, help us to know that that's the motive of authority so that we might come under it willingly, freely, Lord, submitting to your plan and your purpose in our life, knowing that you know you only want what's best for us. Lord, we thank you for it. And help us to recognize improper authority and to flee from it, Lord. Give us that discernment in our lives. 
And uh, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.